A reading from the beginning of the first letter of St. John. Beloved, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked upon and touched with our hands, concerns the word of life, for the life was made visible. We, we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim now to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. For our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing this so that our joy may be complete. Verbum Domini. Et 
Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Johannem. Gloria Tibi Domine. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene ran and went, with, went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we do not know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. Verbum do homini. Today we celebrate the feast of John the Apostle and Evangelist. Tradition has it that he was, he lived in Ephesus and then was exiled in, on the island of Patmos where he most likely wrote the book of Revelation and then returned to Ephesus and died there during the reign of Trajan. He was not um, directly martyred. <clears throat> we do not wear red today, but uh, he lived a, a long life and was prolific. He wrote four Gospels, three letters, and the book of Revelation. He wrote, there's, scholars have debates about it, uh, when he wrote the Gospel, but some, most, I think, believe around 90 AD. And he is, in churches and things, in Christian art, you see him as Gospel represented uh, by an eagle because of his soaring spirituality. He was he strongly defended the divinity of Christ. He was a mystic. He himself called, was called John the Divine. And he makes a clear exposition that Jesus is the Son of God and shows us the divine mystery of God in his gospel. So he emphasizes the divinity of Christ and the glory of Jesus. You know, he is, Jesus is the Word of God who reveals this glory, his glory in his words and in his miracles are called signs in his gospel. We think of the beginning of the gospel, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was, was uh, with God and the word was God. Just a strong testimony to that divinity. 54 times in the gospel, he uses the formula I am, which was the divine name for the Jews, I am who am revealed to Moses from the burning bush. 118 times in his gospel he speaks of God as Father. We see that you know, the miracle at Cana, the multiplication of the loaves, the walking on water, the curing of the man born blind, the raising of Lazarus, you know, all are strong or powerful signs of his power and divinity. His gospel has many of his you could say talks and, and he dialogues with people. Sometimes it's interrupted. They're kind of long uh, communications and it's very vivid. You think of the man born blind where there's this long drawn out exchange. And it's a beautiful, it's one of my favorite passages. You know, I kept asking, who did this? Who did this? He said, I don't know, but you know, I was blind and now I see. You know, he keeps repeating that. And it's so vivid, you know, what that miracle, the experience of that must have been for that man, you know, to, to one moment be blind, next to see. And that faith is, you know, removing this blindness of sin, that we can have this new vision, that faith is this gift of, of sight, of knowledge, of experience of who Jesus is. We think of his exchange with Nicodemus, or the Samaritan woman, or in John 6, where he's going back and forth with the crowd there, the Last Supper discourses, or when he was before Pilate. 
their long exchanges and at times aggressive. He has to combat certain people. Um, but they're very vivid, it's very real. And it's been said that, you know, John wants to draw us and to experience, you know, our relationship with Jesus. You know, John refers to himself a handful of times in the gospel as the beloved, the one who is loved by Jesus. And that he's trying to draw us into that experience that we too, you know, are his beloved, that he truly loves us. The gospel is also sacramental in its approach. We have the miracle at Cana where the water is turned into the wine. This, of course, points to the Eucharist. Also, some see that as, uh, as testimony to marriage as a sacrament, you know, that Jesus is present in marriage between the baptized you know, in a sacramental way. Also, his discussion with Nicodemus about the necessity of baptism. When Jesus is on the cross, his side is pierced. Water and blood flow from his side, an image the church fathers saw of baptism in the Eucharist. And after his resurrection, he appears to the apostles in the upper room, and he gives them the power to forgive sins. He breathes on them and says, you know, who sends you forgiven are forgiven. Who sends you retain are retained. That he gives, he clearly, he alone, you know, God alone has the power to forgive sins, but he shares that power and authority with the apostles. And this is clear you know, in the gospel. We're told explicitly in John chapter 20, I think verse 23 says, these, he's referring to signs, these signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So to have that faith is the beginning of eternal life. The miracles are signs that point to him. You know, if you're driving, you see a road sign, you don't stop at the sign and say, I've arrived. No, these signs point us to Jesus, to his divinity, that in believing, we have eternal life. And that's, as Catholics, you know, we share that with all our Protestant brothers and sisters, this faith in Christ. There's more that unites us than divides us. And that faith is a real sharing, a real beginning of that eternal life. As Catholics, we believe the sacraments bring it to a fullness and a perfection. They increase sanctifying grace in us. They give us the gift of faith. Uh, but it's a great commonality we have in the faith in Jesus and who he is as the Son of God. So the two great themes are that Jesus is the only Son of the Father. He says, you know, in John 14, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The Father who dwells in me does his works. The Father is working through him. And I, I love just that simple spirituality of this complete dependence on the Father. The Father's working in him. The Father's always at work. He says in John 6, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I feel like that, that spirituality of dependence on, I be, you know, if you're wrestling with vice and sin, realize that it's God who's got to overcome that in you. And that our spirituality is always to be seeking to do the will of the Father, the will of God in our life. Jesus himself says, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the Father, that we always return to that, to empty ourselves and to embrace his will, to make that surrender. And that's something we have to get up and do every day. We pray in the Our Father, thy will be done, you know, that we, we are to seek that. I think that covers so much in our life. His will is obviously not sin or self-centeredness or, or living a, a hedonistic life. It's to be a servant. And the other great theme is belief in him is the only way to eternal life. He says clearly, one of the most beautiful passages, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want the fullness of life, it's through Jesus Christ. And whoever 
attains that heavenly blessed life, it is through Jesus. Even if, he does, even if the person doesn't know that. And we teach that, the church teaches that, that through no fault of their own, that the person who has followed the life, I mean the light he's been given in his own conscience and things, and cooperated with grace the best that he could, you know, he can have that eternal life. It is still through Jesus, even though he might not have explicitly ever heard of Jesus. He never had the gospel proclaimed to him or proclaimed to him in a way that he could receive it. He is still saved through Jesus. And it's only through communion with him that we have that eternal life. You know, this belief in him is beautifully emphasized in John chapter 6, where he says, you know, he tells him, do not work for the food that perishes, you know, but for the food that leads us to eternal life. And they get excited, you know, the bread of life that he's teaching them about. And they say, well, what is this work of God that we must do? And he says that you believe in the one whom he has sent, whom the Father has sent, that you believe in me. He's trying to, the first half of John 6, he's trying to get them to believe in him as the Son of God, the one sent by the Father. And then he gives this beautiful, clear teaching on the Eucharist. Again, it's that image of faith in the sacraments leading us to this completion, this fullness in him. I know personally some of my favorite quotes from John, the you know, passages are the wedding feast of Cana, where we see Mary's intercession there, the first sign. We're told explicitly this, so, that the, so that the disciples might believe in him. You know, he works this sign at her request, her intercession. Or Mary at the foot of the cross, where he speaks to Mary, behold your son, and to, to John, behold your mother. An incredible moment in the gospel, Jesus moments before he dies entrusts Mary to be our mother, that John represents all of us. Not simply seeing to the physical care of his mother, he would have taken care of that before, would have set that up before at that point. This is a deep theological, spiritual meaning. We're told that John takes her into his home. And the translation there really means into his being, into his inner life. It's a metaphysical, spiritual reality. An incredible moment. Or the, the, or the one we see at football games all the time, for God so loved the world that he, said that he sent his son that we might not perish but might have eternal life. Such a beautiful, lyrical passage. God so loved the world that he sent his son, that his son would suffer and die for us, motivated by love. He doesn't hate the world. Yes, the world's fallen and it's given into sin in so many ways, but creation is good. And that he wants to take, you know, some, he wants his world back. The Father wants his world back through Jesus Christ that he's going to, through his suffering, death, and resurrection, present this world back to the Father, cleansed, that he offers us eternal life through his Son. We think of his conversation of the Samaritan, with the Samaritan woman at the well, this fallen, broken woman who he deals with so tenderly, and she goes back to her village, you know, to, te to give witness to him, to testify to him, he speaks of, you know, that gift of the spirit of being like this water that springs up for eternal life. Beautiful passage. In John chapter 6, the clearest presentation of Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist. Why we Catholics get crazy about the Eucharist. Why Mother Angelica built a shrine of the most blessed sacrament with an eight-foot-tall monstrance, a huge luna, to proclaim to the world that Jesus is really present there, that unless we eat, the, eat his flesh and drink his blood, he says in John 6, we have no life in us. Clearest teaching. The passage of the man born blind, as I mentioned, that beautiful exchange, this miracle so vivid, and his resurrection appearances. You know, that he, he, you know, he passes through the locked door of the upper room. We have the sacrament of confession but also on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, where he, you know, he has them 
I'll go fishing again, throw this, the net off one more time, this big catch of fish. Jesus, or Peter recognize, or John, John recognizes him as it is the Lord. And on the beach, you know, Peter has denied him, has fallen, and he has that beautiful tender exchange. You know, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Do you love me? You know, he's calling him, he's entrusting him with this great mission, you know, to, to lead the church. And he's a sinner. He's failed. And he picks him up again and sends him out on mission. You know, that's such a beautiful passage. You know, he's there, Mother Angelica used to, she loved that passage, talked about it so many times. And, you know, had the charcoal fire waiting for them on the beach. You know, let's bring some of the fish that you have caught, he says. At his direction, they catch the fish, the fishermen that never catch anything in the gospel on their own, right? At his direction, by his grace, Peter, this weak man, is sent into the world with the 12 to be the foundation stones of the church to proclaim the gospel. And the passage we have today from the first letter of John, this is such a, again, a beautiful explanation of the dynamic of what's going on. You know, he says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen, what we've looked upon, what we've touched with our hands concerns the word of life. There's that theme. That the life was made visible, we've seen it, testify it, proclaim it to you. That what was with the Father and what was made visible to us, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim now to you so that you may have fellowship with us, for our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So these 12, you know, this with the death of the last apostle, John, you know, we have, um, you know, the revelation, public revelations entrusted to them that, you know, all that Jesus came and revealed for our salvation has been entrusted to them They've seen Jesus, they know him, they've touched him. They proclaim that reality, that revelation to us. That's passed on to us so that we might share in their communion. Like they clearly had this communion. They lived with Jesus. They touched him, heard him. They've had fellowship with him so that you may have fellowship with us for our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So they have the fellowship, they have the fullness of revelation, they're proclaiming it to us, giving it to their successors who pass it on to us, that we may share in that same fellowship. And that is the reason, I mean, that's the fulfillment, that's the purpose of mission, that they're sent to draw others into that communion. That's what he says at the Last Supper discourse, is that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you so that the world might believe. They see the oneness, the communion, that is a real share in the very communion of the Trinity. People would see that and be drawn into that communion. The church is a communion. It's the place of this communion. It happens through that proclamation, but also, you know, and even if you're not explicitly on mission or going to some far off country, you participate in that mission when you serve that communion, maybe through prayer and sacrifice, maybe through offering up your sufferings, maybe through reaching out to your neighbor in some way. Any act of love is going to serve that oneness, is going to serve to unite us, is going to serve that communion. We see that in the sacraments, right? Baptism joins us to Christ. Uh, the confirmation is a gift, further gift of the Holy Spirit. In John 6, you know, he says, As I have life because of the Father, the one who feeds on me have, has life because of me. Again, that sharing of divine eternal life in the Trinity, he's giving that to us. In John 6, he says, To remain in me and I in him who, you know, he feeds on my body and drinks my blood, remains in me and I in them. 
The sacraments, that mutual abiding presence, the sacraments unite us to his body, draw us into that communion. And we can serve that by proclamation, witness of a good life, but also through prayer, service, love. That's the mission of the church, how we live, right? It serves that communion. So John gives us many themes of life, you know, and, and belief, faith in Jesus Christ. May we be faithful to his witness and grow in our own personal faith through the word he gives us.